It's really nice to hear sort of what I've been doing uh, with myself for the last 40 years. <laughs> uh, but this really isn't about me. This is uh, about uh, an issue that I take very seriously. Uh, there are very few of us who don't know someone or have personally uh, systemic high blood pressure, particularly our African-American community, uh, where it really is a, a major challenge and uh, it affects our families, our communities, and our health, entire healthcare system. So uh, hopefully you'll bear with me uh, as I go through some details and, and talk a lot about the background uh, of this particular disease and how we can do something about it. Um, no financial disclosures uh, for me. Um, and uh, those of you who have heard me lecture, if, uh, if there was time, I always talk about a little bit of history. Uh, and this piece, piece of history is actually uh, a, a very interesting one because it was an opportunity that I feel was lost uh, in the history of the United States. Uh, talking about uh, President Roosevelt, FDR, and this was sort of towards the end of World War, War II. A lot of decisions were being made, as uh, those of, um, of many of us actually uh, remember what was going on back then. And, the development of the Manhattan Project, which was at University of Chicago, actually, uh, under the old football field, um, where they had the first sustained nuclear reaction and came up with the atomic bomb. And they were going to figure out how to end the war. And so uh, FDR was in the middle of all that. It was probably a little stressful, maybe a little bit. Um, and the, he had systemic hypertension. And if you, you could sort of read through what they were doing, uh, which was really not much. There were agents that they were trying to use, phenobarbital, which is really great for seizures, and it's a calm, it's a sedative, but uh, using that for blood pressure was probably not the best idea. Um, and what happens when you don't treat severe hypertension? You get heart failure, you get strokes, um, you get um, uh, kidney failure. Uh, you, you swell up, and you can actually end up uh, dying, um, which is what happened to him. Now, the, the strange part about this is that it didn't have to happen. This was 1945, okay? And it turns out that in the 1930s, there actually was a solution for, for severe hypertension in what I like to call it the original dietary approach to stop hypertension, um, yeah, the, the last part the little bit that you can see in blue colors, DASH, the DASH diet, they've done some wonderful studies that I'll uh, go through with you. Um, but they didn't uh, really start it back in the uh, 1980s. This was actually came from uh, Dr. Kempner, uh, and he started with the Kempner rice diet. And many of you have heard of this. Uh, it really was in the 1930s. And, and he was treating people with rice and fruit, tomatoes, and he had dramatic results. If you look at what happened to the blood pressure to a patient who came in and was given this food, given away from their American food, um, the result of the blood pressure improvement was absolutely dramatic and very sustained, very consistent. And so we really have had uh, a nutritional approaches to improving blood pressure for decades. And so how long did it take to get really mainstream? Really almost 50 years before it was recognized by the establishment. And still, it's not the first thing that physicians think of. Uh, what are you eating? Uh, what's, what's the dietary content? Um, but I can tell you that we have focused on it in our last set of um, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines. If, if it's missed by physicians there, it's because they're not looking at the document because it's absolutely everywhere. Okay. The scope of the problem, I'm going to do that over the next few slides. Um, if you look at it, you would think that, oh, you know, Kempner Rice diet, people will adopt it, uh, everyone will fix their food, and the incidence of high blood pressure will go down. But as you can see on these curves, it's not going down. It's actually going up, okay, uh, over time. Uh, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and the, it's not just in the United States, it's a global burden of, uh, of uh, severe hypertension. And it's something that we deal with every day as physicians. And so your typical patient coming in, uh, in this case, uh, doing a little bit of a case presentation, you, you can see our really is sort of like the, the amalgamation of what I do in my uh, clinic. A patient coming in, 
uh, referred usually by primary care because the blood pressure was high and they weren't exactly sure what they ought to be doing because the patient has multiple risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, as well as high cholesterol, and they're a smoker. Um, blood pressure is in the 150s. Uh, the cholesterol is not good. Fortunately, the kidneys are good in this case, but uh, there's markers of diabetes. And so the real question that uh, I'd like to focus on for those of you who are listening, those of you who are patients, um, <clears throat> uh, people who are in this situation, the practitioners, is what do the guidelines say should be the next step? Um, do we start medication? Do we monitor blood pressure in the office? Do we do it at home? How long do we do it? And so hopefully um, that we'll keep that question uh, in the back of our minds as we go forward. Okay, well, how big a problem is it? About 78 million adults in the United States at least, and uh, the number goes up depending on how you define it and who's, who's doing the measurement and where you do the measurement. Uh, it obviously is the biggest risk factor, um, uh, and it is a completely modifiable risk factor for the cardiovascular disease burden that has uh, plagued us in the United States for over 100 years. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, how well do we do? Uh, going around the world, this is a, a global problem, and you see countries that are 50-50-50, where 50% 50 of the people who have high blood pressure know about it, 50% of the people who know about it are being treated, and 50% of people who are treated actually have control. Uh, we do a little bit better than that uh, in the United States, but not much. Uh, we have a long way to go. What happens to people whose blood pressure is out of control? Well, they can uh, lose the heart function. The function of the heart, the heart will start to fail. First, it starts failing in terms of relaxation. Uh, if it goes on untreated, you end up with heart failure uh, after the walls of the heart thicken, so-called left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH. Uh, it actually produces coronary heart disease as well, and so one of the major um, causes of heart attack. It causes kidney failure. <clears throat> and if you ever look in a dialysis unit and you go through and you ask, you'll find some diabetics, you'll find some people with lupus, but the majority of people either have or have had high blood pressure contributing to their kidney failure and putting them on dialysis. It contributes to peripheral artery disease, and that is a major issue uh, that stops people from exercising, which uh, then, of course, complicates the blood pressure because exercise is one of the most important things that we can do to uh, avoid uh, worsening of the blood pressure. Retinopathy, take that one personally because it happened to my dad with a hypertensive crisis, blind for the rest of his life. Uh, this is something that people don't recognize, that um, the eyes are very sensitive to real high blood pressures. And uh, everyone who has high blood pressure really should have an ophthalmologic examination because the eyes really do need to be protected. Uh, last but not least, it's strokes and transient ischemic attacks. And the brain is so precious, and I have many patients who will tell me point blank, I'd rather die than have a stroke because it changes, that burden of a stroke changes their life, the family's life, everyone's life around them. Uh, so these are the interesting part of, of all of these organ uh, issues is that they're preventable if we can just get the blood pressure to be normal. We're not alone in this. It really is a global hypertension burden. It seems to be getting worse uh, over time. And we really need to try to figure out how to, to do all of our modifiable risk factors. No one should be smoking. Everyone should know what their cholesterol is. Um, there are a variety of things that we can do to protect our health, but the number one numerically actually is hypertension. So I'm glad Stephen let me talk about it. Because, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Let's talk about coronary heart disease, which really still is the number one uh, cause of death in the United States. And I will talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, and there's an intense relationship between the blood pressure and the incidence of IHD, ischemic heart disease. So those are fancy words for blockage of your coronary arteries resulting in um, the lack of blood flow to the heart. Uh, and that happens uh, progressively as the blood pressure rises. Most people are not familiar with this. Most physicians are not familiar with this slide. If I could just get this on a billboard somewhere, it would be great. The fact that cardiovascular death 
actually doubles with every 20 millimeter increase in the top um, or systolic blood pressure from 115. So everyone thinks at 135, oh, that's not so bad. Well, it kind of is. That is, that if you look at the death rate from cardiovascular disease, it actually doubles between 115 and 135. 155 doubles again. 175 doubles again. Okay? And so everyone should know what their blood pressure is. They should know everyone's blood pressure in their family uh, and be trying to get uh, far below the 130. Okay, let me just delve into one of my favorite topics. Um, uh, the one thing I, as I was listening to all of the things that, you know, that, uh, that someone wrote into my little bio, um, it actually didn't include the part where I worked for Medicare for four years uh, as one of the uh, HOSP, HOPS, that's Hospital Outpatient Prospective Payment System, had to be there four years to figure out how to say that, um, uh, as one of their um, uh, advisors. And what I learned about Medicare, unlike when I went in there the first time, um, Medicare, they're very serious people. They're very smart people. They're very mathematically gifted and they're sitting there trying to figure out how to cover everyone over age 65 with very limited resources. And when you look at uh, what, they're, what they're really facing, uh, they've got a tax base, they've got uh, limits that are set by Congress, uh, and the healthcare expenditures just go up and up and up. And so these are the projections that you're seeing of what's going to happen to our country in terms of healthcare expenditures. It's, it's really not sustainable. It just isn't, okay? And so if you, the most recent data, the uh, Medicare trustees say that Medicare will be bankrupt in 2026, okay? If you look at the expenditures from Medicare, which are shown on this slide, or the frequency, who's, who's taking up the money, okay? It's hypertension. 58% of all Medicare beneficiaries have hypertension. That is the number one disease that our money is going to. If you, the last time I saw cost was actually uh, compiled uh, specifically for disease. It was actually in 2007. It was about 30% of the Medicare cost. If you extrapolate that to next year, where it's estimated that the Medicare expenditures will be about a trillion dollars, uh, and we go with 30% of that, that's a massive amount of money. That's unnecessarily spent. Uh, spent. Um, how about infrastructure, roads and bridges? How about free college tuition for everyone who's got above a C average. There's got to be other things that we could do with that money to improve our society other than spending it on a totally unnecessary disease. So this is my goal. Um, revise everything. Everybody changes their lifestyle. Everybody gets monitored. Everybody goes to their physician. And we actually uh, will reduce the incidence of blood pressure, not completely, but by 75%. I'll actually go through how it is that we could do that in a little bit. 75%, that would be my target. We would save 215, 216 billion dollars uh, that we could do a lot of other things with. Okay. Um, I have to say, it's, not, it's, it's number one, but it's not the only so-called volunteer disease. Uh, the diabetes, the strokes, um, losing your mental function, heart attack, sudden cardiac death, they're all things that we could fix if we work on nutrition and lifestyle. Okay. And so this was my, uh, my quote, and nobody says it anymore because I'm not president of the AC American College of Cardiology anymore, but I would still put it out there. Don't let your culture hold your heart hostage. Cigarette smoking, um, as well as the other, uh, uh, the, di the diabetes, high cholesterol, being overweight, uh, physically inactive, unhealthy diet, these are the things that we can, that we can have a dramatic improvement on uh, where we can actually make a decision today that we're going to work on these things and make them better as a, as a society. Okay, so let's go back to my clinic. <clears throat> I'm on the west side of Chicago now. I used to be on the south side, but our, our population is a little more Hispanic than it was when, when I was, and a little more Mandarin uh, uh, Chinese than it was when I was at University of Chicago. But we still have a lot of African Americans, uh, many people with high blood pressure, and this is our, our, a good typical case, okay? Um, coming to cardiology, referred from primary care, uh, has no cardiac symptoms, and, but doesn't do any exercise program. He, because of the blood pressure, he had been a, 
advice to lower his sodium, saturated fat, and the diet. So he stopped adding salt to his diet. But he keeps going to his favorite soul food restaurant, not really recognize, not recognizing that the sodium is actually in what's being cooked, not just what you add at the table. Okay? Blood pressure, 160 over 92, um, and uh, came back, and after uh, changing the diet a little bit, 155 over 90, uh, and then 142 on home blood pressure monitoring. In the office, blood pressure, 148. Um, he's uh, overweight and uh, has really that fourth heart sound. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of that, and uh, it's using a stethoscope. I have to admit it's a, it's a lost art, um, but... Um, you can actually tell if a person has the heart issues uh, that the, the so-called target organ damage simply with a stethoscope by hearing that extra sound that the heart makes when it begins to get stiff from high blood pressure. Okay, so kidney function, fortunately good, but that hemoglobin A1C. So how many of you know what a hemoglobin A1C is? Almost everybody, yeah. So for those of you who don't, which is about half, uh, half the people, uh, I like to explain it to people um, in in sort of uh, uh, historical terms. You've all heard of, you've all seen a cornflake, right? And then you've seen a sugar frosted flake, right? So, <laughs> the, uh, not that you would eat either one of them, <laughs> but um, if you can imagine the difference between the two, imagine a red blood cell, and then a sugar frosted red blood cell. It turns out that red blood cells will take up sugar and become sugar coated. And depending on how much blood sugar there is. Well, it turns out that since the half-life of a uh, red blood cell is about a month, that means that you could actually draw uh, a test and measure how much sugar there is on a red blood cell, and it'll tell you approximately, on average, what the blood sugar's been for the past month or so. So it's actually a very helpful test. Um, and so when you have that, anything above 5.7% means that you're at least pre-diabetic, pre and if you're above 6.3%, then you actually are a diabetic. And so it's something that everyone should have if there's any question about diabetes. Uh, it's a test that everyone should, should know what their numbers are. Okay. The LDL cholesterol, in this case, was elevated. The triglycerides were elevated. So LDL cholesterol, that's the one that fills up the arteries uh, with plaque, causes heart attack and stroke. Triglyceride is really a marker of how, how well are you doing. If your triglycerides are ele elevated, you're basically either uh, genetically uh, problematic or most likely you're doing something wrong. Refined sugar, fried food, not exercising, alcohol. If you put all those things together, your triglycerides will go up. You see a lot of triglycerides go up in people who, who go vegan uh, because they start trying to get full off of things that are uh, rapidly absorbed um, uh, carbohydrates such as pasta, bagels, um, pretzels, and the triglycerides will go off the charts because you can, you know, you know triglycerides, you, you think of it as fat, well it is fat, and if you eat fat, your triglycerides will go up, but if you eat sugar, your liver will just make fat. And so you end up with uh, an issue there that really is a marker of bad things to come. Okay. Um, the rest of it, the EKG shows exactly what the, we would have imagined based on that exam uh, showing that the heart was stiff. You see that the voltages are high, and that says that there is thickness of the heart. Uh, and premature beats from the upper chamber, the, the atrium, that, again, is a reflection of the stiffness of the heart. So, still going with the lifestyle um, uh, advice and doing monitoring blood pressures at home. After eight weeks or so, uh, blood pressure at home is 138, uh, uh, much better. 138 over 70 with a range of 132 to 156. Okay, so, so I'm going to do some audience analysis. What, what do people think um, uh, we should be doing? Should we start medication at all? Uh, if we are going to start medication, what would be the indication? So, uh, who says that we should start uh, at 160 for the top number? Okay, I got one. All right, 150. That's a, that's a couple. 140. Okay, how about 130? All right, so we've got this. This will be a great discussion because we're all over the place. And physicians are in the same boat, uh, and so I'm going to go through the evidence. Okay, so now once you, so we decided, regardless of which level you voted for, um, once you start it, what is the 
target for the blood pressure. So we've got the threshold, where are we starting? But what is the target? Um, where do we want that blood pressure to go? Uh, how many say 150? No takers, okay. Glad to hear that, <laughs> okay. Okay, that's a, okay, 140? 130? 120? Everybody wants 120, interesting, okay, all right, okay. All right, so this is uh, a little too, uh, I see there are three people over there who can actually see <laughs> what that slide says. It's not shown to, sh uh, to put up for you to actually see the numbers unless you get the slides, which you're welcome to if uh, uh, Dr. Shore allows you to download them. They're fine with me, obviously. Uh, it's all public information and publications. But this is the number of guidelines. One, two, three, four, five, six, a bunch of guidelines, all saying uh, different things around the same topic, though. That you know that the target, you know, that the threshold, the target. Well, um, basically, we've had a lot of disagreement, um, and it's based on looking at evidence in different ways. Uh, to summarize it very quickly, um, there was a what a, we like to call a sort of a rogue guideline <laughs> that came out um, that told us that if you are over age 60, and I resemble that remark. Uh, that your blood pressure target would be 150, that you don't start medication unless lifestyle changes have failed to get you below 150. So 150 would be the, the uh, threshold for treatment and, and also the target. And um, we're very concerned about that. The people who wrote the document were not in agreement, and it's the first time in my career that there was a so-called minority report. For those of you who remember that movie, you know, there actually was um, uh, five out of the 17 guideline members who wrote up and said that the whole thing was completely wrong. Um, they went through the evidence table of why it was, and I'd actually lectured on this about eight times before it hit me what happened to them. Uh, and actually, I, I sent my little um, uh, epiphany uh, to the lead author of the Minority Report, and his jaw dropped, dropped as well. That is, what happened was that there were several studies that said if you were over age 60, that your outcome was not that different if your blood pressure was left at 150 or so. And so, but the problem was that that was controverted by a couple of studies that said, yeah, you really do need to, you, you will decrease stroke, you'll decrease heart failure, you'll decrease heart attack, if you treat below 150. So you have conflicting evidence, and you're talking about saving healthcare costs with drugs, saving side effects of drugs. So of course the committee would just say, well, okay, well, we're not going to try to over-treat people. The problem was, and the epiphany was, when you looked at those five different studies, the three that said um, that you don't need to treat, they were all less than three years. Now what does that really mean? Well, high blood pressure takes time to hurt you. And if you leave the blood pressure elevated for a long time, you will get more problems, more heart failure, more strokes, more heart attack. And if you only uh, take a look between now and two and a half years from now, you're not going to see enough events to make a difference. And so I think that is what really happened in that committee. They were looking at short-term evidence. So if you confine yourself to the longer-term evidence, then it's very clear that you need to get that blood pressure substantially lower and I hope that uh, anyone who's on a guideline or while uh, listening to this will remember that that's the evidence we want, not the evidence that's really short term. Okay, so um, moving forward, we did take into account the um, uh, longer term evidence and come up with a new guideline to try to get rid of that 150 issue. Um, as well as to summarize what is the, the best way of treating people, um, when do you start, uh, how, how long do you go with lifestyle, and I'd really like to summarize for you that new guideline, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, but if you look at it, you don't just see my name, you see some really smart people uh, who have been given their lives to the study of hypertension. Uh, and the most important part of that slide is actually the fact that there are so many um, uh, organizations, Association of Black Cardiologists, American Society of, um, of Hypertension, that is, we brought in a broad spectrum of all kinds of stakeholders to try to make sure that this guideline was relevant to every population. Uh, and I hopefully we really did that. Okay, so 
Um, this is where the, uh, it was kind of nice to have the publication come out and then all of the arrows started coming right at us. Uh, and so uh, one of the major arrows is the idea that we really did change the definition of high blood pressure. And so uh, it used to be that we were talking about uh, less than 130 <coughs> was pre-hypertension. Uh, we got rid of that. We now say, and I think uh, based on this audience, uh, a lot of people did go with this because you were all looking for that really low blood pressure <laughs> on, this, on the case where we voted. Um, normal is less than 120. If you're one, more than 120 or 120 or greater, that's elevated. If you're more than 130, that's stage one hypertension. Uh, and then stage two is above 140 and you're gonna do poorly. We need to, to move quickly. Okay. Now, one of the first things that happened is that we, we were, uh, despite the fact that none of us had any relationships with industry, um, it turns out that a lot of uh, arrows were being shot at us saying that this was just trying to increase the number of drugs that were being sold uh, by changing the uh, definition of high blood pressure. Well, first of all, that meant they didn't read the document because as you and I are gonna go through uh, momentarily, we talk more about lifestyle uh, than anything else. And if you look at, at it, the number, if you really do the lifestyle, the number of people shown on this slide, the number of people who are treated with drugs goes up a tiny amount uh, compared to the number of people who are diagnosed. Uh, because we really are not talking uh, primarily about drugs. Okay, now there are some people um, where you really shouldn't spend a lot of time doing a lifestyle alone. Everyone needs to do lifestyle changes. But uh, where is it that you shouldn't do it alone? It's people who have target organ damage already and people who have a lot of risk, okay? And so the diabetic, coronary heart disease, chronic kidney disease, um, with the blood pressure of more than 130, we do the lifestyle and the drugs. And we, can we get the person off the drugs? Certainly. Uh, some of them are more effective than others. It depends on how plant-based you become, uh, how seriously you take the exercise. And we're going to go through each piece of those evidence. And the evidence that I will show you is all additive. And so if you fix this thing and that thing, you can add up the differences that you're going to get. And uh, many people actually are, almost everyone who is on blood pressure medicine, who takes the lifestyle changes we're gonna talk about seriously, their blood pressure medication requirement goes down and sometimes they come off. And that, that's very common in my practice. Okay, so um, one of the major issues that we went through is can we get an accurate blood pressure? Um, it is a kind of annoying that you, every time you measure your blood pressure, you get a different number. Well, part of that's just normal physiology. That is, when you breathe, your blood pressure changes, okay? So keep breathing, okay? It's, it's important. Um, but you try to get people um, to, uh, that's my mom calling. Okay, so, so all right. I'll, she'll leave a voicemail. No, no worries. Okay. All right. Um, so we want to make sure that the patient is having blood pressures if they're going to be done in the office, and I'm putting a big if on that uh, for reasons that we'll talk about. Um, you want to have the patient calm. You don't want them dealing with the fact that there was no space in the parking lot and they went around five times, um, that the expressway was difficult getting there. You want to give them a little bit of time. Um, make sure that you're using a really good technique um, making sure that the patient is, is seated, uh, upright position, arms relaxed, and, and measure it several times and do the average. That really is the best way to try to get consistent office blood pressures. But out of office blood pressure monitoring is one of the major messages that I have for anyone who's listening to what our guidelines have to say about hypertension. And I will spend a lot of time talking about this, okay? So, um, so how many people here, I wanna say, either have high blood pressure, had high blood pressure, know somebody with high blood pressure, or if concerned about high blood pressure? Everybody in the room, right? That means that you should have a blood pressure cuff at home, okay? So let's do it. How many people here have a blood pressure cuff? Right. Fantastic, it's only 75% of you. Why am I holding up four fingers? Because I have four blood pressure cuffs at home, <laughs> okay. All right, and so, um, so it's something that everyone should be doing um, to monitor uh, exactly what's going on. 
You should monitor your blood pressure very frequently unless it's just so stable and never changes and there are very few people uh, in whom that happens. Um, it, it sort of has taken a while for this to catch on, but now we have the European Society, uh, NICE, which is the, um, uh, the United Kingdom, we have pretty much everyone on board now saying that home blood pressure mon monitoring is an important thing to do because it, it, the data has been out there for a while, but the practice has been very, very slim, okay? Um, we actually want to uh, make sure that people are, are trained, that they understand that they want to use it in, in the upper arm, although there are risk cuffs that are perfectly well validated, and you want to make sure that uh, the person is uh, measuring them multiple times. You try to do a, a sort of a seven-day period where you're measuring and you sort of get used to it, and doing two or three measurements is, is a good idea if it's a person who is very anxious about measuring their blood pressure, which many people are, you're gonna get an artificially high reading, and then I'd say take it three times, or take it until you're bored, but I'd take it at least three times, and take the third one, uh, or the last one, as the real blood pressure. If you're not particularly anxious about it, then just do three of them and do the average, okay? Uh, doing it sitting after five minutes with the arm resting at heart level. So yes, just gravity, can fake your blood pressure low if your arm cuff is way above your heart, uh, or it can fake it high if it's below your heart. So your blood pressure plus gravity, okay? Trying to make sure that you're not doing uh, cigarettes or coffee uh, right um, before the measurement is, is important as well. Why are we doing this now? <coughs> Excuse me. The data is shown here that if you compare the uh, outcomes based on the blood pressure of uh, that how, much, how many events do people have, and you're comparing that with the blood pressure, okay, you'll see that it's much more meaningful to have a blood pressure that's elevated at night, that is at home. Uh, on a 24-hour monitor, the worst thing that we have is a conventional office blood pressure, even though that's the way uh, everyone has been managed for blood pressure for decades. It's the, the least helpful of all. Okay, and here we go. Okay, you can compare them and you find out that what you have in the clinic may not be what you have at home. And the nighttime blood pressure is actually pretty important. There are ambulatory monitors that'll sort of just very quietly do your blood pressure at night. Why even bother with that? It's the, on, the idea of dipping, that there are dippers and non-dipping, uh, non-dippers. Uh, who are the non-dippers? Well, what is dipping? Well, first of all, uh, if your blood pressure is you know, typically 125 during the day, then it's probably going to be closer to 115 at night. There's sort of what we call a diurnal variation in blood pressure. Blood pressure falls at night naturally. There are people where it doesn't fall. And so this is the answer to the age-old question of you've got one patient whose blood pressure is you know, 140 in your office and they seem to be fine. You've got another one's blood pressure is 140 in the office and their kidneys are bad and they've got the fourth heart sound and the EKG shows you know, damage and all this stuff. And so what's the difference between the two? How about the, the nighttime blood pressure? So whose blood pressure doesn't fall at night? Uh, African Americans, that'd be number one. And it's, it's not African genes, apparently because it's urban and rural African Americans. It's urban Africans, but not rural Africans that tend to have non-dipping blood pressures. So it's something about society, something about perhaps uh, you know, healthcare disparities and uh, econo socioeconomic status. Um, but as you move up the uh, socioeconomic ladder, it doesn't actually improve. And so um, then there's obesity is a major issue. Uh, particularly if there's sleep apnea, you end up with a lot of changes uh, that happen because of sleep apnea. Blood pressure can be extremely high, heart rate going up, rhythm disturbances, heart rate going very low. Um, and so nocturnal or nighttime high blood pressure is something that we all should be concerned about if you have one of those risk factors. Okay. Um, so if we could get everyone's blood pressure controlled uh, day and night, uh, that would be exactly what we're hoping to do. And let's see. Okay. I think I hear a question. What's that? So I, I actually, I can't quite hear you, but um, 
they gave me an hour and a half, and I promised to go an hour. <laughs> so, uh, at least I promised myself, so that we could do all the questions at the end, because I'm, I'm sure they're going to give you a microphone, because I really can't quite hear you. I do hear the fans, but <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, so, uh, but you'll hold on to it? You promise? Okay, 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 we'll write it down, okay, all right, uh, or just if you really, uh, you could come on up if I, I just can't hear you. Um, so, oh, this question is whether or not older people are non-dippers, they certainly can be, um, but the, the ones that mostly have identified, some uh, Asians, particularly Southeast Asians, African Americans, and obesity are, are the biggest risk factors, okay. All right, and so, um, so bottom line on our high blood pressure readings out of the office, really important. Uh, our guideline talks about using it more and more. Why? Uh, it's these two things, white coat hypertension and mast hypertension. If you don't do blood pressures out of the office, you'll never recognize that these two things ex exist. Now, how many people here have heard of white coat or office hypertension? Everyone, right. How many people have heard of mast hypertension? Very few. So what is it? Okay. So uh, it's a sad commentary on society, but there are places, particularly like the south side of Chicago, uh, some gangs, some drugs, uh, uh, scary neighborhoods, an older person typically, living alone, uh, perhaps. Um, sometimes it's elder abuse, but you will find places where the time that they feel the most secure is where, when they're in the 11th floor of Rush University Professional Building in the cardiology office. They're surrounded by people who like them, who are being kind to them, and their blood pressure is substantially lower than it is at home. As sad as that is, that's mass hypertension, and it's actually fairly common. And so if we look at it, um, at the white coat effect, um, the blood pressure are higher at, um, in the office than they are out of the hospital. Masked, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, where the blood pressure is out of control at home but not in the office, they actually have substantial meaning. That is, the masked hypertension, which is estimated to be somewhere between 13 to 30 percent of our older patients, um, really has a big impact because you're missing it completely. You're missing an opportunity to treat someone um, and to, to work on getting the blood pressure down because you don't know about it, and this is the data. Um, those are uh, survival plots without an or with an event, and you see the biggest difference at the top is uh, having a blood pressure that's normal in the office but elevated at home and then treating that person, you have a dramatic effect on their bad outcome. Okay, so mass hypertension. So we talk about that in the guideline, and you know the the algorithm is just simple logic. You make sure that you have your office blood pressure if it's elevated or normal. You then go ahead and do them at home as well. Uh, and if you have uh, elevated blood pressure at home, you treat that uh, very seriously.